Uh, and that's the challenge we face, is that even as we're gaining in our technology, we are not gaining in our net reduction of the environmental consequences of what we're doing. <coughs> because people want more. They drive more, they want bigger cars, they drive more miles, they, in fact, we're using more transit, lots more freight, and of course, lots more flying. Uh, so there is no diminution in demand for transportation in the world, uh, quite the opposite. Continues, and anybody who travels around the world will see how people of the world are beginning to travel on airplanes everywhere. Uh, so what we're now seeing is just ever-rising demand. And I think as Steve rightly pointed out, and I, and I think this is really the key transition that we're beginning now, is that these worlds have been separate, the world of electricity and the world of transportation, with the exception of the march of electric railways and, and transit and so on. But for most of the world, whether it was ships, planes, cars, it was mostly about petroleum. Um, and today, we are finally beginning the convergence of these markets, and I think this is critically important. Uh, obviously, one is for charging uh, batteries and vehicles, and the other potentially is producing hydrogen for, as a fuel in the future. But as these converge, lots of opportunities begin to appear, and that's, I think, where Steve was taking us. Uh, I believe that the best case is that over the long term, essentially all ground transport will become electric driven. That is, an electric motor will turn the wheels. Now the interesting question is what's upstream of those electric motors? Is it a internal combustion engine? Is it a diesel engine? Is it a turbo generator? Is it a fuel cell? Is it a battery? Uh, so I think that as we move toward an electric platform for all ground transportation vehicles, we are going to see an enormous wave of innovation in a great variety of technologies to provide that electricity to turn the motors of those vehicles. Uh, and that's going to be the interesting playground over the next, year, next decade or so, is what are the different options? This will create actually a lot of confusion in, in part for the uh, consumer, and also a great challenge for the fuels industry, uh, because we're going to be looking at a variety of kinds of fuels. Uh, Dan Sperling and I last summer were driving a uh, new BMW, uh, ultra low sulfur, very high speed, fabulous diesel, right? But it needs ultra low sulfur, so we have to mandate uh, very low sulfur fuel oil. Uh, uh, gasoline, uh, diesel fuel, pardon me. So it takes a lot of integration, and as Steve pointed out, connection among these things, and they don't happen smoothly. We may want to save the remaining hydrocarbons for the hard to replace stuff like aviation fuels, but even in the end, I think we can get there with biofuels. Now, obviously, efficiency is the most important thing we can do, is just simply reducing mileage and get, making our vehicles much more efficient. But every single technology has major issues. Uh, whether it's every supply technology, we don't like wind in the wrong place. My neighbor doesn't like the solar cells on my rooftop because um, I live downhill from him and it reflects up into his light and he whines at me all the time. Um, everything has its problems. Uh, there are no technologies, uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, there's nothing without an impact. As a result, things will move slower than we want. There will be uh, resistance and pushback everywhere on almost everything. Uh, every regulation will have its own variation of opposition. Uh, and that is, I think, part of the issue we face is the politics of this are not as simple as the technology. In fact, the politics are the real key here. The technology, we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do. It's the politics that we don't. And, you know, the list of technology options, I don't need to go through this. This is all very familiar to all of you. But we have a variety of technological possibilities, both for power and electricity, a variety of ways of approaching vehicles, and so on. Uh, and it's going to be a time of great innovation. I'm not worried about that side. Um, I'm much more worried about this, that the real surprise-free energy scenario that we are actually headed toward is a world of continued high demand growth, uh, even if we improve efficiency a lot, just all those people, all those per capitas out there, we're going to be in a world of higher and volatile energy prices, and I'll come back to that. Uh, almost every one of the alternatives is very slow to scale up, uh, whether it's centralized solar or new nuclear facilities or coal, gas, uh, coal uh, with carbon capture, and I'll come back to that. So what this means is more coal. That's the reality here in the United States, India, China in particular, even potentially back in Europe. They may even be opening coal mines again. So it's coal, 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 coal. And now with respect to oil, it's very interesting to see. This is the graph I used a year ago for oil prices. Look at the numbers. 
when we put the uh, super spike up there for $120 a barrel in 2008 or nine, must be nuts. Can't, how could it possibly go that high? That was one year ago. And here we are at $140 a barrel. Uh, so the perceptions and realities can change in this market very, very fast. And oh, by the way, it's highly likely the next move is down in price of oil. And some people say, well, what's the problem again? Uh, so we will find ourselves in a highly volatile price environment. Uh, this has nothing to do with speculation. This has everything to do with supply and demand. That is, we didn't build enough oil facilities, and we also have an enormous demand from China and India and the United States driving demand. So we are going to be in a world of uh, highly volatile prices, and what this will mean is more coal, more oil, more gas, more hydrocarbons. Uh, this is the IEA forecast with a bit more of coal than they actually had. This is the real surprise-free scenario for the future. Unless we change direction fundamentally, we are going to be an ever more coal-intensive economy 20 or 30 years from now. So we block nuclear, we can't do enough renewables, uh, and so we will be building lots more coal plants. And this is what it looks like. This is the IEA's forecast of coal for China, India, and the United States. This is how much coal will be built over the next 25 years. If we succeed in the next decade or so in coming up with good carbon capture and sequestration, that little green area there is what we will have implemented by 2030. So we're going to build a lot of dirty coal before we build clean coal. Uh, and that is our big problem, is all that dirty coal. Uh, because this is how much CO2, the yellow bar, is how much we put it into the atmosphere uh, since the Industrial Revolution until roughly the year 2000. The red bar, equal to the yellow bar, is going to be how much we do from the Indian, Chinese, and U.S. plants alone over the next 25 years. We're going to double it. The question is, what can we do to stop that bar? That's really the most urgent question. What can we reduce? How much of that coal can we not burn uh, over the next 25 to 30 years? So the realities are climate change is underway. It's not uncertain. It's not a distant prospect. It's now. And it's one of the, the fact that people think it's a 100-year problem is part of the reason that we don't have a strong, strong sense of urgency. And what I mean by that is not global warming. That's not the issue. It's about increasing frequency of extreme events, high impact on particularly vulnerable societies. This is what happens when the climate changes. It doesn't change gradually and slowly and smoothly. It oscillates wildly. What you see there is 75,000 years of history with that little bar up to the left there, this guy here, that's all of human, modern human history, the last 10,000 years. That's global warming, okay? Big jump. Now, I'm not suggesting we're gonna go back to this environment. What I am saying is that we are already beginning to see an increasing frequency of high amplitude extreme events. What it means is that the mean temperature, the mean climatic conditions are moving further and further from the mean. Some places will change hardly at all, and others will change profoundly. Others will have their societies shattered. Others, some places will be uninhabitable. Bangladesh is over. It's over. It will not exist 25 years from now. Uh, we will be the greatest humanitarian crisis the world has ever seen when we have to evacuate 160 million people from Bangladesh to China and India, and they ain't too well. The other is that there'll be increasing variance around that. So we'll see increasing frequency of increasing extremes more often in more places. That's what the reality of climate change is. It's not about gradual global warming. It's about extreme droughts. It's about floods. It's about torrential rains. Uh, that's what it's about. It's all about water. Every mechanism of climate change is about water. Too much, too little, sea level rise, and so on. So that's the reality of climate change and why I believe it is so urgent. So unfortunately, like the climate, our policy is very chaotic. Uh, it is not coherent. It's inconsistent and highly variable. All you have to do is look at the solar credits that are being debated right now. Mm -hmm. and that neither the Democrats or the Republicans can get their act together to pass the credits in a coherent way to keep the industry moving in the right direction. 